Mark 14, 51 through 59. And the subtitle is this. This is going to catch your attention. Uh, the Naked Man and the Kangaroo Court. So you're going to see both today this morning in the text. So we started last week on the sundown on Passover, which begins Good Friday. So really we're in the early hours on the evening of of Good Friday, which will go all the way to the evening of the next, uh, will be our next day, of course. Christ's ministry is about to, his earthly ministry is about to come to an end. Now people will say, what do you mean earthly ministry? Does he have a ministry somewhere else? Yes, he does. During his life on earth in the incarnation, his earthly ministry was to intercede and to die for sinful men, to teach and to do mighty deeds of miracles, and then to, of course, die on the cross to redeem sinners. But Christ has a different ministry now. He still has ministry. He still ministers to God. He still does something. His ministry now is to intercede for us in our prayers as he is the great high priest of heaven. His ministry location has changed from earth now to heaven. Last 24 hours of Christ's earthly ministry. Last time in the Gospel of Mark, we witnessed him in the prayer of, in the Garden of Gethsemane in prayer and the, and the soldiers, the temple guards come to arrest him. And all scatter except, except John, right? They all kind of flee and go different places here. Let's begin this morning in Mark 14, verse 51 through 52. Still in Gethsemane. And a, young, and a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. In other words, he's in his pajamas, if you want to know what's happening here. And they, the temple guard, seized him. But he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. Now, many scholars conclude that this young man is none other than the gospel writer himself, John Mark. Many believe this young man who wriggled out of his clothes, his pajamas in the garden that night, and scurried off in the darkness is the author of the gospel, and his name, of course, is John Mark. Now, Mark was not an apostle. Mark was not one of the twelve. Mark was an affiliate member of the disciples. He was probably too young to be a disciple. He was in the sort of the outskirts, the next group of folks who followed Christ, it was John Mark's family who hosted the Lord's Supper in their home. It was John Mark's family who opened their home to be the first church in, uh, in Jerusalem at the Pentecost. It was John Mark's family home where the church was born, where the church would meet for many, many decades later. In fact, if you were here for Sunday school class, this is a reminder. If you weren't, listen up carefully this morning. In the book of Acts, we see that the house of John Mark becomes a refuge for the church, a meeting place for the church and a refuge for runaway Christians in the first century. After Peter is, it miraculously escapes from prison for the angels releasing him from his shackles, he goes to John Mark's house. Look in Acts chapter 12, verses 10 through 17. This is Peter's miraculous deliverance from prison. The Bible says when they passed this is Peter and the angel. When they passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate leading to the, into the city. It opened for them of its own accord. The gates just fly open. The gates unlock. And they went out and along one street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname, whose name was Mark. And many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Verse 14, recognizing Peter's voice in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. But they said to her, you're out of your mind. Right? He's supposed to be in prison somewhere. We've been praying for his release, but he's not supposed to be here. But she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, it is his angel, verse 16. But Peter, but Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, saw him and were amazed. Why amazed? They've been praying for his release, and now his release and shows up at the doorsteps. Why are they amazed? I never understood that, but they're amazed. Verse 17, but motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And he said these things to James. He said, tell these things to James and his brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. 
So Peter, not wanting to incriminate his, the early church there in Jerusalem, decides to let them know he's been freed. Don't pray for me to be released anymore. And then, of course, he leaves, says, I can't stay here lest I incriminate you in my escape. You guys keep praying for my safety, praying for the church's health, but I'm going to go somewhere else. And don't pray for my escape, pray for my safety, right? John Mark, he's the author of the Gospel of Mark. It's not his, his gospel, it's Peter's gospel. John has been, Mark has been with Peter the whole way through ministry. Now, toward the end of Peter's life, when he's on house arrest or in prison somewhere in Rome, he's in Rome, end of his life. I want you to notice that John Mark is beside him. First Peter, First Peter 5.13 says this. She, talking about the church, who's at Babylon, which is a nickname for the city of Rome in the first century, who is likewise, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Now, we don't greet folks with kisses these days, but it was a common expression in the first century. And Peter says, at the end of his ministry, end of his life on this earth, while he's in prison in Rome, he writes to the churches scattered across Asia Minor, and he says, who is with him at this time? John Mark. The young man who, who wriggled from his pajamas and out of Christ's arrest. The young man who prepared the table and the meal in the house for us at the Lord's Supper. John Mark has been with me all these decades later. Peter, now in prison, sends a letter by way of his mentee, his student, John Mark, who is his son in the faith, and says, take this to the churches scattered in Asia Minor. It was John Mark who watched on the sidelines in the shadows at Christ's arrest. When the band of temple guards came into the garden of Gethsemane with torches and spears and clubs that night to apprehend Jesus, it was Mark who was standing there that saw the whole thing play out and was in such awe he was frozen in the steps until someone grabbed him by the wrist. And then he wriggles free when he comes to his senses and shakes loose of his pajamas and runs out of the house naked back to his home in Jerusalem. With the disciples scattered in Christ in custody, it's now time for the trial to begin. Look in verse 53. And they led Jesus to the high priest. And all the chief priests and elders and the scribes came together. Verse 54. And Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. I said all the disciples scattered. Let's be honest. Judas, when he left, he went and gathered his money for doing what he said he would do, turning Christ in. And then Judas goes back to his own place, wherever that is. And then John goes not immediately to Jesus. He goes to get the women, mother, his, his mother and the other ladies, to be with Christ uh, at, to be with Christ through the trial and the whole, the whole bit of this. But Peter stays outside the high priest's house in the courtyard area where there's a fire and there's people gathered. Listen carefully. Peter, warming him, warm himself by the fire outside the priest's house, reminds us of the loyalty that he had for Jesus. Remember Jesus, Peter says, though they may all fail, I'll stand with you. Though if we go with you, I will die with you, Jesus. I'm, I'm, I will never betray you, but I'm willing to die for you. It was Peter who took, took out his sword and cut off Malchus's ear. Remember Peter, the, the impulsive, reckless, courageous young man? Here he is in the courtyard of the, of the chief priest, the high priest's house, still carrying his sword under his garments. Peter's waiting outside with the sword still strapped to his waist. And he's uh, not just bewildered what's happened to Jesus, but he's also quite angry and probably pretty upset on top of that. Being bewildered and angry is a bad combination. Peter's very emotional and stable right now as he warms himself by the fire. He's ready to fight or to run. Psychologically, he's like a caged animal who's ready to launch out at someone who sticks their hand near the cage. Just before all the, the denials, I want you guys to notice this. Peter is very loyal. He is loyal to the very end. He sticks with Christ as he said he would. He's Jesus' is ride or die. I'll be with you always to the very end. Look, verse, verse 55 here. Now the chief priests... And the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death. But they found none. Verse 56. For many bore false witnesses against him, but their testimony did not agree. Verse 57. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying this. We heard him say, here's the quote, I will destroy this temple and that is made with hands, and in three days I'll build another not made with hands. Verse 
verse 59. Yet even about this, their testimony did not agree. The trial of Jesus begins in the living room of the high priest around 2 o'clock in the morning. When most folks in Jerusalem and around about are asleep, sleeping off the events of the day, the trial for Christ starts in the living room of the high priest's house. They're gathered in that room of the Sanhedrin, guarding the doors, the temple guards. Jesus stands without, without a defense attorney by his side. Now, next week, we'll begin to look at the trials of Jesus. But before we get to the trials of Jesus, I want to show you six reasons why the trials were invalid. The rules that they broke to put Christ to make him guilty. The six rules they broke to make him guilty. Number one is this. Number one, the judges were supposed to consider the, val the validity of the eyewitness testimony. They were supposed to beforehand interview the eyewitnesses and see if they all matched what they were saying. Remember when the eyewitnesses came forward, they had different testimonies, they all were disagreement? It was supposed to be thrown out at this. Deuteronomy chapter 19, verses 16 through 8, the Old Testament says this, If a malicious witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, then both parties to the dispute shall appear before the Lord, before the priest and the judges who are in office in those days. The judges shall inquire diligently, and if the witness is, if the witness is a false witness, and has accused his brother falsely. So number one, they broke the very first rule is, before the trial, interview your witnesses. And if there's description, description between the accounts of the witnesses, you discard their testimony. Two opposing views can't be true. If one man accuses you of this, another man says something different, they can't both be right. They can both be wrong. One could be right, one could be wrong, but they can't both be right. And so on those grounds alone, throw the testimony out. The Bible tells us that the eyewitness testimony at Christ's trial in the living room of the high priest was in disagreement. They couldn't agree on what he'd done wrong. And the eyewitnesses came forth with conflicting testimony. Number two, the trial was rushed. According to the Mishnah, which is the oral law of the Jews now written down, a person who's pronounced guilty of a capital offense, you know, worthy of death, could not be killed until the next day. Christ is deemed guilty and killed on the same day. No time for, pardon the pun, cross-examination. He's guilty. He must die on this very day. A breach of protocol, a violation of judicial rules of the Jews, a, a breaking of the contract that Jews have with God, that when a man is guilty of capital punishment, he might be guilty on a Tuesday, but you can't crucify him or kill him until Wednesday. They've got to rush him to the cross. On the same day, at 2 o'clock in the morning, he's guilty. He's got to be put to the cross by that morning. Number three, which is, sounds like number one, but it's a slight, a slight variation. Number three is this. The court accepted the testimony from false witnesses. First, they didn't see if it was false. And the, and the second thing they did wrong, of course, here, was they accepted it even though they knew it was false. I'll read the Deuteronomy text one more time, but listen carefully toward the end of this. Deuteronomy 19, 16 through 19. The Bible says this. Again, if a malicious witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, then both parties to the dispute shall appear before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who were in office in those days. Verse 18, the judges shall inquire diligently, and if a witness is a false witness and has accused his brother falsely, here it is, verse 19, then you shall do to him as you had meant to do to his brother. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. Meaning if you're a false, a false eyewitness in a court of law, and you say he's guilty of this capital offense. What happens to you if you're found to be lying of this? You're to be taken outside of the town in stone. The false uh, accuser, the false testimony giver is supposed to be taken outside and then nailed to the cross or stoned in the streets or, or hung from a tree. Whatever the punishment would have been for the guy you're accusing, the false testimony giver should be received the same punishment. When I read the Gospels and I see that, conflicting eyewitness testimony. I don't see where any of the false accusers were taken outside and crucified or stoned in the streets. Do you? It was at this point of the trial that the high priest said, stop, 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 stop. We're conflicting here. You said this and you said this and this doesn't agree. Let's throw it out. But before you throw it out, which one is lying? 
Oh, he's lying. Fred, get up. Take him outside. The guards are taking him outside and stoned him in the streets and let Jesus walk out the back door of the house. But did that happen? It did not happen. Christ wasn't free to walk out and go home. Instead, on conflicting testimony, he was then found to be guilty. Number four, the fourth mistake in the trial of Jesus was this. The, chain, the charges changed mid-trial. When you notice at 2 o'clock in the morning, the charges begin, he's blasphemed. When they get to Pilate, they don't mention blasphemy at all. Instead, they say he's a traitor to Rome. The charges go from blasphemer to treason, right? to traitor to Rome. How many folks would go before a criminal trial and some way midpoint through the, the, the prosecutor says, wait a second, the, uh, the district attorney has now changed the charge of this guy to a different charge. You know what happens? That trial is thrown out. You might start a new trial, but you don't start with different charges midway through. You've got to call new evidences, gather new witnesses, the same in ancient Israel. They change charges mid-trial. Jesus should have been, thrown, his case should have been thrown out immediately upon hearing this. But they say, well, Rome won't crucify him because he's a blasphemer. Let's get him guilty before the religious folks of this and then guilty before, before Rome of that. Number five, and this is something you guys may have noticed here. Number five, the trial occurred before sunrise. The trial occurred at two, three o'clock in the morning, in the early, early morning hours before the sun even came up. One expert in Hebraic law said this, Criminal cases can be acted upon by various courts during the daytime only. The lesser courts, the lesser assemblies, from close of morning service till noon, and the greater assemblies from noon until evening. Jesus was tried not in the morning, not in the evening, but basically in the cloak of darkness. Declared guilty without a trial. Declared guilty without defense of his own. Declared guilty before the Sanhedrin in the cloak of darkness. And number six is this, the trial occurred outside of the courtroom. You know, we don't have a perfect system of justice, but we realize that when someone's charged of a crime in this, in this country, they should have a public trial. They should be before a, a, peer, a jury of their witnesses, a jury of their peers, right? And be before a community of witnesses. When someone is tried and convicted in this country, it's not behind closed doors in secrecy. It should be done in public for all to see this. And the same among Jewish law. In fact, this, number six, the trial occurred outside of the courtroom. According to Jewish law, quote, a sentence of death can be pronounced only so long as the Sanhedrin holds its sessions in the appointed place. Next, the quote from the Talmud says this, After leaving the hall, the court, no sense of death be passed upon anyone. And I remind you guys, where does Christ's trial take place? In the hall of the Sanhedrin? In the courthouse down the street with all the uh, uh, eyewitness observers? No, his trial takes place in the living room of the high priest's house at three in the morning. Not only is it in the cloak of darkness, not only is it out of the public eye, but it's in a place you wouldn't have found it if you're looking for it in Jerusalem. In the high priest's living room, the trial takes place. Let's be honest here. Look at Christ's trial. He was guilty before he was arrested. He was guilty before he was sentenced. He was guilty in their eyes before they ever sent the dispatch of guards to arrest him in Gethsemane. He was already in their eyes guilty. This is just a kangaroo court, a makeshift, a pretense of what a court is supposed to look like. It's all made up. Christ was crucified on charges of blasphemy to folks in, who in fact were blasphemers. I was reading this week and it kind of cut as I read this, it kind of came to mind this week. Uh, you know what the Bible says that God hates? I'm going to read this morning Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19, and see if you see what God hates at the trial of Jesus. Proverbs 6, 16 says this. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to Him. Listen carefully. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among his brothers. When you read the trial of Christ, it's like reading, reading Proverbs chapter 6 out loud. If you were there that day, you could have stood up and said, 
But Solomon said in Proverbs chapter 6, he hates every last one of you in this room because you breathe out lies, you make wicked plans, you shed innocent blood, you sow discord among the believers. You're doing the very things God hates. Next week we'll begin to look at the trials of Jesus. We must remember that it was sin to put Christ on the cross. That it was sin that made the cross necessary. It wasn't just the sins of the Sanhedrin. It was your sins and mine as well. It was your sins and my sins that made the cross necessary. John 10, 7 through, 17 through 18 says this. Jesus says these words. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This charge I received from my Father. And then years later, the Apostle Paul said of the crucifixion of Christ, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all. And then John the Apostle said this years later as well, John, 1 John 3.16 says this, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Christ knew the hearts and the intents and the motives of those who put him on the cross. But, no, but please don't get me wrong. I don't, I, I don't regret the fact that Christ went to the cross because it's the only way by which Christ can save sinful men. You see, God works in history. He works in all things of history to accomplish his will. He even uses the, the verdicts of a kangaroo court to put his son on the cross to accomplish the greater good. You know, sometimes we don't see the forest for the trees. Sometimes we go through life and we can't see the whole big picture because we're looking at just our circumstance. But the big picture is this, that Christ was using circumstance to put himself onto the cross. Listen carefully. God was going to redeem sinners, but he was going to use sinners to accomplish his perfect will. You know, Christ is Savior this morning. If not, come today. Let us pray. Father, we come before you this morning.